Hello from the English Peak District and welcome to the Polar Learning Channel. My name is Phil Wickens and I'm going to talk to you about the geology of Antarctica and how Antarctica is a land of dinosaurs and volcanoes. But first, a little bit about myself. I have been guiding in the polar regions for over 15 years and I'm also very lucky to have worked with geologists on several geological projects deep in the heart of Antarctica. Here we are detonating explosives on an enormous glacier so that we could study the rocks below over two kilometres of ice. And in this project, we studied fossils for 100 days, collecting over 2,000 specimens along an ancient coastline 1,500 kilometres in length. And as a mountaineer, I'm very lucky to have visited lots of fascinating places all along the top of the Antarctic Peninsula. In this presentation, I'm going to tell you the story of Antarctica and how it came to be where it is and how it has changed over geological time. Now, Antarctica is not all flat and white. It is a land of geological extremes, from rocks that were once molten, such as here in the Latadi Mountains, to vast areas of rocks that are full of fossils, such as here on Alexander Island. And then there is the fat, vast flat expanse of the interior, which here is broken through by an extinct volcano. And then there are the long chains of mountains that form the Antarctic Peninsula and the Transantarctic Mountains. So here we have the world that we know today. And on the left is time in millions of years, with today at the top and going downwards back in time. Today Antarctica is down here, centred around the South Pole, and what we're going to do now is go on a journey back through time, through millions of years, to a time when Antarctica was in a very different location. And Antarctica is here, just north of the equator. So this is how the world appeared 740 million years ago. That's even before your parents were born. It's even before your grandparents were born and your grandparents' grandparents, and your grandparents' 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 grandparents were born. It was a very long time ago indeed. So what did Antarctica look like at this time? Well, we know that it was at the equator, but this was no beach holiday. There weren't even any palm trees. It was a cold and desolate world where the only living things were in the sea. And these included the very first primitive plants. And as they gave off oxygen, the earliest animals appeared in the sea, such as sponges and these strange sea animals. These are fossils of extinct animals from 800 million years ago. But Antarctica didn't stay at the equator. Deep inside the Earth, very hot molten rock started to rise very, very slowly at about the same speed that your fingernails grow, until it was just below the surface. And as it spread apart, it then dragged the continents with it. And so, by 600 million years ago, Antarctica was now just south of the equator as part of a very large ancient continent that geologists call Pannotia. Now, the Earth at this time was a very cold place indeed, and we know that the glaciers on Earth even existed at the equator. We call this the Snowball Earth. But life continued to exist, especially in shallow seas where mats of green bacteria grew in colonies called stromatolites. Now these are modern day str stromatolites in Australia and this is a fossilised stromatolite from 600 million years ago. A hundred million years later, although Antarctica has barely moved, three smaller continents called Laurentia, Baltica and Avalonia have split away and the Earth has become a lot, a lot warmer. This is how Antarctica looks today, but 500 million years ago the bit that we call West Antarctica didn't exist, and instead there was just a long ancient coastline. Let's look again inside the Earth. Now we call the rock that is solidified on the surface the crust. And crust isn't just what makes up the continents, it also lies under the oceans. And when it gets pushed against a thicker piece of crust, this happens. One section of crust gets forced downwards towards the centre of the Earth, where it then melts, and geologists call this pushing downwards subduction. 
and it is subduction that was happening along the southern coastline of what would become Antarctica. And as thin ocean crust was pushed under the continent, several smaller pieces of continent collided with Antarctica and created the start of the Transantarctic Mountains and the mountains of the early Antarctic Peninsula. Well, at the same time that this was happening, big things were also happening to the plants and the animals. During Snowball Earth, the glaciers had deposited so many minerals into the sea and the plants had given off so much oxygen that when temperatures became comfortable again, complex plants and animals were able to evolve very quickly. And we call the rapid appearance of plants and animals at this time the Cambrian Explosion. Now nothing actually exploded, but it was still a very interesting time and some very strange animals started to appear. These are invertebrates called trilobites. And this here is the world's very first predator called Anomalocaris. And fossils from this time are found in Antarctica as, as commemorated by this wonderful stamp of a trilobite. But things wouldn't stay like this forever. 443 million years ago, another ice age led to the formation of an enormous ice sheet in the southern hemisphere. And this changed not just global temperature and sea levels, but also the very chemistry of the oceans themselves. And this was catastrophic. 85% of all life was wiped out. But not to worry, life has a habit of bouncing back from the odd mass extinction. And 20 million years later, the climate was again warm and stable. Antarctica has moved a little further south, and the three continents of Laurentia, Baltica and Avalonia collided <laughs> to form the Caledonian Mountains. And these would have been as high as the Himalayas today. Plants now grew on land, and these included the club mosses, the ferns and horsetails, as well as the very first land animals. And these were strange animals called sea scorpions or eurypterids. Moving forwards 60 million years, Antarctica has moved even further south. The continents have once again <laughs> collided to produce the supercontinent that we call Pangaea. And the climate is warm and dry. This is known as the age of the fishes. And the placoderms, or the armoured fish, had very strong fins that actually allowed them to move on land. And eventually, Animal, uh, animals evolved, such as this strange animal. It's called Ichthyostega, or the four-legged fish. This was found in East Greenland, and it had lungs and other adaptations that would allow it to live on land. However, at the end of this period, the seas became starved of oxygen, carbon dioxide levels dropped in the atmosphere, and temperatures plummeted, and this caused another mass extinction. Three quarters of marine species disappeared over several million years. But once again, the Earth bounced back, and by 300 million years ago, Antarctica is now located around the South Pole. Along the coast of Antarctica was a shallow sea, and this trapped enough sediments that they became eventually the rocks of West Antarctica. The world is again warm and humid with vast swamps and forests. This here is part of an Antarctic tree fern. And from fossils, we know that there are also insects in these forests, such as this wonderful dragonfly fo uh, fossil. Now, along the coast was a shallow sea, and this was home to mollusks called brachiopods, or umbrella shells. And these ones shown here are from Alexander Island in Antarctica. But the Earth's climate would change again. And at the end of this period, there were lots of volcanic eruptions. And yes, you guessed it, there was another mass extinction. And nearly all living things on land and in the sea disappeared. So all life after this evolved from the small number of species that had, had survived this extinction. Well, beneath the continent of, of Pangaea, an upwelling of hot magma started to split Pangaea apart. And by 160 million years ago, North America had separated and the early Atlantic Ocean had started to form. And, and Antarctica is now part of a new and smaller continent that we call Gondwana. 
The Earth was what is described as a greenhouse. It had high temperatures, high humidity, and lots and lots of carbon dioxide. The seas around Antarctica would have been full of life, and in particular, large numbers of squid-like ammonites and belemnites. And fossils of these are found in Antarctica, such as these ones that I found in the Halberg Mountains, and another one on Snow Hill Island. On land, what would become Antarctica was covered with dense forests. This is part of a fossilised tree from Antarctica's Halberg Mountains, and here is a fossilised fern from the coast of Alexander Island. And from fossils that have been found, we know that the animals that lived in these forests included the dinosaurs. Well, we'll come back to the dinosaurs of Antarctica in a short while, but this here is how Alexander Island appears today, with layers of rocks packed full of plant fossils. And the hills that you can see in the far distance include Col Nunatak, where there is even a petrified forest. I've already explained to you about subduction, where the Earth's crust is forced downwards, and this was happening in a part of western Antarctica, and this created a line of volcanoes that would eventually become the Antarctic Peninsula. So how does subduction create volcanoes? Well, as the plate is forced downwards, it heats up and it starts to melt. And because this molten rock has impurities in it, such as seawater, it starts to rise. And if it cools before it reaches the surface, it solidifies into rocks such as granite. But if it reaches the surface, it will create volcanoes. And it was a line of volcanoes that would become the Antarctic Peninsula. Well, most of the rock that makes up a volcano is very soft and friable. And so they started to erode into the sea, and that's where they formed the sandstones and mudstones at the base of the Antarctic Peninsula, such as here in the Latadi Mountains. And these sediments are full of marine fossils. Now, it was while looking in these, these fossils, while working in these mountains, that my geology partner, Dan, and I came across this tooth that was later found out to be from a marine dinosaur called an ichthyosaur. It's quite strange to think that this is how these mountains would have looked 160 million years ago. And it wasn't just marine dinosaurs that lived in Antarctica. In 1990, geologists on Mount Fitzpatrick in the Transantarctic Mountains found the remains of a large carnivorous dinosaur that they named Cryolophosaurus. This means the cold crested lizard it would have been about the size of an elephant and had a distinctive crest across its head. And other dinosaurs were found with it, including a flying reptile or pterosaur and the foot of a one-ton long-necked plant eater that they named Glacialisaurus. Now what is unique about these dinosaurs is that they have only ever been found in Antarctica, which suggests that there may have been some sort of barrier such as a mountain range that separated these dinosaurs from the dinosaurs in the rest of Gondwana. But not all Antarctic dinosaurs are only found in Antarctica. This hippopotamus-like dinosaur is called Lystrosaurus, and this has also been found in India and Africa, which of course supports the theory that once upon a time these continents were once joined together. 80 million years ago, the land masses started to look a little bit more familiar. The land that would become Antarctica had no ice, but was covered with thick conifer forests. And it's at this time that the very first mammals appeared, such as the squirrel-like Purgatorius. And on Seymour Island in Antarctica, this interesting fossil has been found from the, this period. This is the jawbone of an extinct marsupial, which shows that Antarctica probably still attached to Australia at the time, as well as South America. Well, along the coastline of Western Antarctica, subduction continued, and the mountains of the Antarctic Peninsula that we see today are the eroded remains of these volcanoes. As these volcanoes eroded, more sandstones and mudstones were formed. Now, this is Snow Hill Island, and it's here, and on the neighbouring Seymour Island, that we find some of Antarctica's most interesting fossils. This is the leg bone of a plesiosaur, which was a long-necked 
carnivorous reptile. And this is the jaw of a mosasaur, which was a short-necked lizard with paddle-shaped fins. And it's not just marine reptiles that have been found in this area. In 1986, an ankylosaur named Antarctopelta was discovered on nearby James, Clark, uh, James Ross Island. Now this was actually a herbivore that was covered with armoured plates and protective spikes and had this wonderfully clubbed tail. Well, many more fossils have been found on these islands, fossils that are much more recent. We'll come back to those in a little while. So it's strange to think that Antarctica was once home to a population of dinosaurs. That is, until 66 million years ago. Now this extinction was caused by a combination of volcanic eruptions and changes in sea levels and sea chemistry, but it was a giant asteroid that hit Mexico that finally ended it for the dinosaurs, as well as many flowering plants and other animals. The survivors were those animals that could scavenge or could eat a varied diet. Well, gradually the landscape recovered and only one group of dinosaurs survived this extinction. These dinosaurs, they had three toes, they had hollow bones and are called the theropods. And their ancestors included T-Rex. And eventually these dinosaurs evolved. <laughs> Yes, they evolved into the birds, and fossils of birds that lived in Antarctica at this time have been found on Seymour Island. These were ancient penguins, and the amazing thing about them was their size. The largest penguin that has been found so far is named the Colossus penguin, which stood a staggering two meters high, which would have made a, a visit to Antarctica somewhat interesting in those days. However, it would have, been, would have been even more interesting if you had come across this bird. This is Paraphysornis. It's also known as the terror bird. And this was a carnivore that was twice as tall as a human. And so 23 million years ago, this carnivorous bird would have hunted in the forests that covered Antarctica, and it could run faster than a horse. Now, although Antarctica was not yet covered in ice, it still had up to six months of darkness. And so it makes you wonder just how Paraphysornis could hunt during the darkness of the polar night. Did it have infrared vision? It's something that we will never ever know. So this would certainly have been a very interesting time to be an Antarctic tourist. <laughs> But the forests of Antarctica wouldn't last forever. At around this time, Antarctica split away from South America, so Antarctica became isolated from the other continents. And because of the spin of the Earth, the Southern Ocean was able to flow unhindered around the continent. And it was this lack of mixing with warmer waters to the north that led to the cooling of Antarctica. And so this leads us to the present day, with Antarctica located in its current position, and covered with a sheet of ice up to nearly five kilometers thick. And eventually, it was visited by a very strange species of ape. <laughs> so let's summarize what I have been through. We have followed Antarctica's journey across the world, starting at the equator 740 million years ago, and finishing in its current location, centered around the South Pole, and composed of rocks that give us the history of its geological journey. Thank you very much for listening.